Hello, my name is Dr. Liz Angoff. I am an educational psychologist in the Bay Area, California, and I am here to talk to you guys today about how we talk to kids about their different brains. So we are going to be talking about empowering neurodivergent children by helping them understand what's going on in that amazing brain of theirs. Now, talking to kids about their testing results, about how their brains are different is really, really tricky. And this is true no matter where you are in the uh, kind of cycle of support, whether you are assessing a child, whether you are supporting them with building skills, it's just a really hard thing to talk to a kid about these, these differences. And this is for a few reasons. I mean, one is that the language that we use to describe what's going on with neurodivergent kids comes from a medical model and can be very negative. And then it can be jargony and just difficult for even adults and parents to understand. So translating that into kid words is really, really hard. Kids, of course, have uh, you know <laughs> shorter attention spans um, than adults. And the kids that we work with tend to have very much shorter attention spans. It's overwhelming to hear all of this information and we worry, parents worry about a child's self-esteem when they hear that something is harder for them. Of course, the time, I mean, when do we <laughs> have these conversations? Um, and then a lot of parents are very worried. And it's interesting because parents are, you know, kind of um, don't want these conversations to happen for a variety of, of reasons, but they often come from anxiety and worry and triggers because our parents are related to our kids. And so a lot of them went through the same kinds of things that our kids are going through. Um, they may or may not have been formally diagnosed and they may or may not have integrated that into who they are as a positive piece of their identity. So the idea that my child is going to struggle the same way that I'm going to, no, I want them to know that they're no different than anybody else. They can be successful. They don't have to let any of this get in their way. It's coming from a good place. But our kids are different. They're unique. And that's amazing. And we want to be able to present that message. So, but with all of these things in place, I mean, why not just get down to the work that we're going to do with the kids? Like, why even have these conversations? Um, why not wait till they're older, till their language is more advanced, till their attention spans are longer, till they're not maybe as overwhelmed by these kinds of things, till um, they can make decisions without their parents there. The thing is that, you know, the um, we know, you know from your practice that kids come in knowing something is different, but they don't know why. So they start to come up with these ideas and these stories for to make sense of why things feel different. And these stories, these narratives that they come up with are just harmful and negative and stay with them for a very long time. But when we talk to kids about their differences early and often, we're helping them to shift that self-narrative from whatever version of I'm broken to I'm built differently. And not only am I built differently, but the way that I'm built is actually pretty awesome. So how are we going to do this? Well, the strategies that I'm going to present today, they're built off of research that um, may be familiar to you as practitioners. So there's uh, collaborative proactive solutions, which is Ross Green's work. And um, from here, we are learning how to talk directly to kids to engage them in solving problems together. Because so often the piece that's missing from our interventions is the kids' perspective, their experience. And we need to help them to articulate that experience if we're really going to understand what's going on. Of course, we want to incorporate neurodiversity affirming practices so we can get away from that medical model of understanding kids into a, um, a neurodiversity perspective. We want to give kids language to maintain that growth mindset that things are building and changing. 
Um, and a lot of this work comes from a field uh, called therapeutic assessment, which is actually thinking about assessment as a therapeutic process, not just a what's going on process, but something that actually results in change. And so this, these, all of these things kind of come together in this brain building framework that we're talking about. And this framework um, helps us shift assessment from just an identification process, what do we call this difference, to an empowerment process where we're helping kids to articulate what's going on, to describe their lived experience, and to advocate for what they need without shame. So there's five pieces that I'll present to you today. And, you know, as educational therapists, you may be involved in any, you know, part of this. Sometimes you might see kids before they have an assessment. Sometimes you may be the person administering some of the assessments. Some, and then most often you're probably receiving a child after they've had an assessment, but nobody's talked to them. So um, as I present things, there may be different uh, take-homes or nuggets that different people take from pieces of this presentation. I want to let you know that everything that I talk about is available on brainbuildingbook.com slash handouts. Um, most of these are downloadable for free. Um, please use them, uh, adapt them for your practice. And, um, and then we'll talk about the brain building books, uh, which are uh, workbooks you can purchase to really facilitate this conversation. Uh, my disclosures, I am the author of the brain building book uh, and the proceeds are uh, from these books are what help support the, the site as a whole. Uh, and we'll get into what these books are in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about when you get a kid before testing um, or when you are the person who's going to be doing some of the assessment. So there's this concept in the assessment world that feedback starts at intake, that when you're talking to parents, that first meeting with parents, you're kind of planting seeds for where you're going to go, testing out theories, and you're already starting that process of um, having the conversation about what this means for the child. But for children, um, we really want to think about how we're preparing them for the assessment process before they go in for that first meeting. So because they hear testing and they think, oh my God, I have to do well, but it's not about that. It's about exploration. So we want to really set kids up as collaborators. We want to identify a problem that the child wants to solve. And this is going to apply to just working with a child when they come in to work with you. They're parents or teachers have said they need to work on their procrastination skills or they need to get better organized or, um, you know, they need help with this. But what's, how does a child describe what's going on? What's important to them? And then we're going to be really transparent. You're here, um, not just to hang out with me because I'm so cool. You're here because we're going to solve a problem. So I have a little handout uh, that I send home with parents. It's also available in Spanish that has some of these uh, kind of scripts and example language uh, that is one of these handouts you can download to adapt to your practice. Um, and if um, uh, you're advising families about how to prepare their kids for a formal assessment with a school um, or a, um, an outside evaluator, this can be really helpful for, for advising them. So it might sound something like this. I've noticed you're working really hard at math, at writing, at um, making friends this year, but it still seems pretty tough and I'm not sure why. I've been thinking that if we knew more about how you learn best, your teachers, your parents, and I could do a better job helping you. And then we can describe that the psychologist is going to do different activities or I'm going to do different activities with you and I want you to let me know if things are tricky, let me know, or the person that you're working with, let them know so you can figure out why. And I'll put it out there that the way that we think about problems is often really different than the way that kids think about problems. And that language becomes so important when we're doing this work with kids and the language kids use, that's going to help us explain their brains to them at the end. So adults might say things like, this kid can't pay attention. And the child might say, I can't pay attention. But more often than not, you know what's going to go up here? Yep, it's boring, right? Or other kids are distracting me. 
We love to talk about processing problems, but kids don't talk about, I have trouble processing information. They just say, I hate school, or this is confusing. We talk about executive functioning skills, but kids just feel overwhelmed by too many assignments or they're just like, oh, I can't find anything. And so when we're working with them, we're going to solve the finding things problem or we're going to solve the too many assignments problem. They might have poor working memory, but their experience is just forgetting stuff or things are too many steps. So we're going to help you with um, times when there's too many steps. They might rush through things but they might feel like it takes too long. So we're gonna help you with assignments that take too long. And I love this one because we as adults really get on kids for procrastinating, but often it's not a problem. So recognizing what is the thing that is important to the child? And can we start from that point to help them with that problem? Even if at the end of the day, we're working on the same thing, language matters. So, the first thing that we're gonna do, whether you are helping a kid prepare for an assessment or you're um, helping them get engaged in the work that you're doing with them with um, educational therapy, we want them to be asking their own questions. So we can think about how this translates. So we just went through the child problems, like it's so boring. So we can ask questions like, huh, I wonder why school is so boring. So we just turned a kind of defensive, like, oh no, I can't do it into a curiosity. If math is confusing, let's ask why math is confusing. And let's write that question down so we can keep track and gather information about it. I have too many assignments. Why does it feel like I have so many assignments? I keep forgetting stuff. Why do I forget stuff? How do I get my parents to stop nagging me? These are all good questions that really help to engage kids. So here's an example. Joe, uh, Joe, Joe is an elementary school student. Joe hates writing. It's hard for her to pay attention. So really typical referral question. Can't write or really struggles with writing. Hard to pay attention. Joe, I asked Joe, what do you want to know? Um, from our work together. And she's like, I don't know. I don't care. Just get me through this. <laughs> like, okay. Well, I'm not going to take, I don't know for an answer. So let's help you ask some questions. So we're, we're going to um, get more specific about the types of questions we can ask. So we might ask kids, you know, everybody learns in a different way. Is there anything that you'd like to learn about how you learn? We can get compare contrast questions. You know, you said that you love to read, but I know you're here because you hate to write. I wonder if that could be a question we ask. Um, this one is a true story. A kid who like hated math and that's why we were there, refused to do any math, but we were talking about what she likes to do and she likes to make treats and she loves to bake. And like, hold, hold the phone. <laughs> Baking is math. You're doing a bunch of math when you are cooking. What's the difference? And she said, well, with baking, there's a cookie at the end and <laughs> there are cupcakes at the end. I'm like, okay, let's see if we can make math class feel a little more like cooking math because you're not bad at math. You're using it all the time. There's something about math class that feels very, very different. Now we have a question to ask. And now we've inspired some curiosity like, oh, it's not just my math brain is broken. There's something else going on. I also love asking what's next because we're celebrating the success and then asking about the next step. So, you know, I, you've, your reading really took off. What do you want to work on next? So that's from a strength-based um, place to ask those questions and get curious. And then, of course, we can always translate boring because so many kids just say, I don't know, it's boring. But let's just ask a question about what's going to help it be not so boring. Um. And we can get curious about, you know, different things that they say. So um, this is an example of um, kids talking about different kinds of challenges. Like a lot of times, some types of things are fun challenges and some are frustrating challenges. And then a, a child is really struggling to reflect on their, their own performance or behavior. Sometimes I'll just notice things and you guys are in such a great position to notice things over time in your work with kids um, and just to present it as a curiosity. 
Because the more we can get kids to start getting curious about how their brains work at the beginning of our work together, the more we're shifting that I can't, I'm embarrassed to, isn't it interesting? So as we kind of did this process, just observing different things, listening to what Joe had to say, we came up with some questions, really unpacked writing. I said, Joe, writing has so many different pieces to it. There's a handwriting piece. There's an idea creation piece. There's, and she said, oh, I don't have a problem with ideas. I have so many ideas. It's like, oh, well, some kids have difficulty choosing an idea. Is that what's hard for you? She said, yeah, that one. Um, she also has some fine motor challenges and she's like, it just takes so long. Great. Now we have a question. How do we get faster? And her like that, the pay attention, she feels like she pays attention fine, but school is just really, really boring. And it's hard to remember things that are boring. So now we have some great assessment questions going on. Um, and we've gotten Jo into a place where she's very, very curious. So finding a problem that a child wants to solve is going to give purpose to the assessment or it's going to give purpose to your work together. And it's a signal of respect to the child. And, you know, in all the work that we do to help children, sometimes I feel like we forget this piece that the child is bringing so many important things to the table. It's also going to give adults a common language to explain what's, what's going on. Okay, so I recognize that um, most, most of you will be working with kids after they've had an assessment. And this is where the brain building books become really, really helpful. Um, so um, since I'll be showing different pages um, of the books, um, I just wanted to introduce you to what these look like. So this is for elementary school-ish students. The, the ages are recommended. I've had people use um, this particular book up into adulthood, but there are just some um, really great images and pictures that uh, kind of walk you through explaining, talking to, getting that curiosity out of kids and you document it and then they take this book home and it's their record of their brain. So it's going to be a self-advocacy tool. It's a place you can keep track of things as you're working together and discovering more and more things about their brain. Um, and um, a lot of the handouts that we're talking about, as I said, are on brainbuildingbook.com slash handouts, and you can download these ones for free. So if you're using the books, that actually, uh, that helps bring everything together, but these ones you can download piecemeal. So what we are doing to help kids, to start this process of helping kids talk about their brains is building a shared language. So we're gonna teach them some brain language um, we're going to share a construction metaphor that we can build on <laughs> to help them talk about what's going on. We're going to document how they describe the words they use to describe their strengths and challenges so that we have that language for explaining to them what's going on. We're also going to talk about what they've already built to get that growth mindset piece in. So it might sound something like this. A while ago, you worked with Dr. Smith for an assessment. Do you remember some of the activities we did? You did. It turns out we learned a lot about your brain. Can I share with you what we learned? And this, this question is actually not a throwaway question. Can I share with you? Because it lets kids know that they have some power in this conversation. It's kind of vulnerable <laughs> to talk about things that are different about you. So giving kids some choice and control over that conversation actually helps bring down that emotional wall. Um, so we can start by just talking about the brain. And so the image on the left is, uh, I use for younger kids because it's just more general terms. The image on the right, I'll use for older kids because we actually have the names of the different lobes in here. If you have additional knowledge about the brain, feel free to add um, in uh, other, other pieces that feel relevant for your child. Um, and in this activity, we're going to bring the child's expertise into the room, get that curiosity. I can't say it enough. Um, and we're going to help them see that they're using their whole brain all the time. So there are no parts that are broken. It sounds like this. Your brain is made up of different parts. Each has a different name and a different job. What are some of the things you like to do and how does your brain help you do those things? So here's Joe. 
She loves rock climbing. So that's what we used as the example. Um, and you can think about the way that you use your brain to rock climb. So you obviously have to use a lot of balance and coordination. Uh, I asked her, what do you see? And she said, I see all the different colors of the handholds. Um, she has to know where things are so she can kind of, she, um, in her class, uh, her teacher or coach kind of helps her to visualize where she's going. And, um, she, she also mentioned that, um, she has to pay attention, but she talked about knowing when to relax. And we know that there's going to be a lot of communication between, um, the amygdala and the frontal lobe to kind of help with regulation of that anxiety when you think you're going to fall, but you can take a deep breath. So there's a, a circuit, a lot of communication going on. And that front part of your brain is super involved, not only in paying attention, but helping you to calm down when you feel, feel anxious. Um, so here's another example. This is Alex. He's a little older. He loves playing Minecraft, which if you've been practicing for five minutes, you've had a million kids who love Minecraft. Um, and so we, again, we can talk about all the different ways he uses his brain to play Minecraft. And often I'll ask him to come up with these, these ideas. Um, and, and we add to this, this over time, um, you can see how it kind of evolved with the different colors as we talked about, um, different things like, like all the parts of his brain that have to get activated to talk to friends, which for him was a little bit harder. Okay, here's our construction metaphor. I love this metaphor. So your brain works, all those different parts work by, um, sending messages from one part to another using these cells called neurons. And neurons are making pathways. And these pathways connect like billions of tiny roads in your brain. So you can think of some of these roads as your highways. And now I can ask, what are some things that are highways for you? What comes easily to your brain? Um, well, for Joe, for example, this was remembering stories and experiences. She has a ton of creative ideas. She loves to make people laugh. She jumps into new things. I think this was something that I kind of took from interviews with parents. Like, it sounds like you're not scared to do new experiences. And she's like, yep, that's me. Um, and um, during our conversation, as I said, I said, you know, your parents are concerned you have trouble with attention. I don't have trouble paying attention. I can rock climb for forever. Like, okay, well, yeah, focusing on things that you really enjoy. I think that's one of your superpowers. Um. So we also have construction zones. So we can think of other things as challenging. Um, and these are your construction zones or the skills that you're building. So we can think of some things that used to be hard that you built, and then the next construction projects that you have. Um, and, uh, as I mentioned before, these are, um, pages from the brain building book and we write right on these together. And I'm using what the kid says and I'm writing those things so that when they go back to this book later, they recognize what we put because we were doing it together. It's not just something that I wrote down for them to, to read later. We're doing this together. So for Joe, she recognized that, you know, she used to just shout things out, but now she can actually raise her hand and wait to share her ideas. Um, and it's something that she had gotten a lot of positive feedback for. She was pretty proud of. So I asked her, all right, well, what are we working on next? And as I said, we had done that work of getting those questions and curiosity. Um, and so we talked about like writing at the speed of her ideas and focusing on boring things, which for her was math. She didn't like math that much. So um, we're going to focus on math. Um, I, I mean, we're going to... Um, uh, like focusing on, we're going to help her to focus on math. And it was interesting to, to hear her nuances of how her attention works and where it's turned on and where it's not. Um, so now this leads us to the third um, part of this framework, and that is no surprises. So we've done, you know, a ton of work with this child to get them curious about their brain. We've gotten using, used that metaphor to kind of build that shared language to understand where their strengths and challenges are. And now when we explain what's going on with their brain that makes them unique and different, it's not a surprise. And the thing that makes hearing about your diagnosis so overwhelming 
And what puts us at risk of hurting kids' self-esteem is when we're surprising them with things that don't make sense to them. So when we use their words and what's important to them, what they've observed about themselves, then it starts to make sense. Oh, that's what ADHD is. Oh, that's what autism is. That's what dyslexia means. So we can use um, the brain building books or we can use this assessment summary just to kind of write in some of the highways and construction zones that can help us build our understanding of this child's um, child's brain. So there's no big reveal. We're going to answer their questions and curiosities. You know how you're saying that like um, it's so hard to focus on math? Well, we figured out why. We're going to use their words. And so in this way, we're going to build a child-friendly um, diagnosis. So somebody diagnosed this child with whatever. So we don't have to worry about proving that or making a case for the diagnosis. That was done. That's a separate process. But the way we talk about it is going to be wholly dependent on um, helping the child find their own words to explain their experience. And honestly, if we are taking a neurodiversity affirming approach to understanding brains, we have to start with lived experience. We have to start with the child's experience. Kids have a hard time explaining their experience, but this whole process is helping them to do that over time. So well, let's get back to Alex because he's a great example of this. So parent questions, why is it difficult for him to control his behavior? Why does he struggle socially? Does he have ADHD? Um, second session working with Alex, he says, by the way, I don't have ADHD. No way, not even close. Okay. So we have a long way to go. But through that process that I talked about, about getting curiosity, observing different things, um, we are, um, we're trying to, we're getting some of the things that are interesting to Alex. And so, you know, I noticed that he did really well when he was kind of moving around, bouncing on my, on the yoga ball that I have. Um, and I said, I noticed that that kind of helps you. And he says, he says, yeah, but I get in trouble for it. Um, and so he's like, he's like, okay, well, yeah, let's ask that as a question. Why do I move around? And why do I kick my feet, even though I know I'm not supposed to? Um, he also, you know, we talked about his behavior in class and how it had really improved. Um, and he's like, yeah, it's better, but I still get in trouble. Um, but it's not because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And so this was his question. Why am I sometimes good behaviored and sometimes not? Oh, such a good question. He described himself as very spontaneous. And I laughed at everything he said. This kid was hysterical to me. And he's like, Dr. Liz, most people don't laugh this hard at my jokes. I was like, you know, that's a really good question. I wonder why. Because I knew in the back of my head that there is a pragmatic concern. There's a social skills concern. And man, I jumped on this question because it felt like, like this may be really, really helpful. Um, Alex's highways, um, puzzles and patterns. He's got a strong vocabulary. He's really eager to learn, <laughs> um, which could also be described as interrupts class a lot, but you know, we can take that positive spin that he just has a lot to say and he's super, super curious. He's got this emerging self-awareness and a desire to learn and improve. He's really thinking about it. And we learn from testing that he remembers small chunks of information best. He also has some construction zones. That spontaneous behavior is getting him in trouble. He has trouble sitting for a long time. His joke timing could use some help, which he recognized. Uh, and focusing on boring things is hard. And you can see that we, you know, wrote all of these things on his, um, in his book. So we were accumulating this stuff over time. So when it came time to talk to him about what was going on, it's all there. All we have to do is say, you know what, there's a name for this. So we can do this by saying something like, we learned that your brain is built in a way that makes your highways come easily. And we also learned that construct these construction zones are much more difficult. But it turns out you are not alone. This pattern happens a lot. So often, in fact, that we have a name for it, or we have some special words to describe it. I put that second part in there because sometimes kids come in with a um, kind of amorphous diagnosis or monitor four, and we might not be ready to name it quite yet but we can always talk about um, executive functioning skills, for example, in the case of like maybe ADHD, maybe not, 
or we can talk about, you know, like these are called pragmatic skills or um, this is called like sometimes people have, um, you know, really big feelings and they're not sure what to do. So these are, are special words and terms that we can use whether there's a specific diagnosis or not. So it might sound something like for you, your diagnosis means your brain is built in a way that makes your highways come easily and your construction zones much more difficult. That's all. So for Alex, this kid who was like, I don't have ADHD. Well, let's look at what we learned about you. Your brain is built in a way that makes puzzles and patterns, vocabulary and participating come easily. And it can also be hard to focus on things you don't like. Time your jokes or sit still in class. That's what ADHD means. Oh, that's what ADHD means. Now it makes sense because he's already agreed to all of this stuff. You can say, you know what, that's, that's what it means for you. This is how your brain is built. And he says, okay, now I get it. My jokes take off, but they don't always land. And this was so important for him. So he attended his IEP meeting. He was, this was in sixth grade. Um, and he attended his IEP meeting to share his book with the team. And, um, I asked him during the meeting, I said, is there anything you want to share with the team? And he said this, he said, uh, I want you guys to know that sometimes my jokes take off, but they don't always land. And that phrase made everybody laugh and just was so powerful in communicating. My intention is good. I have good intentions. I'm not trying to. Um, disrupt the class. I'm not trying to do any of these things, but sometimes I miss the cues and my timing's off. So, so powerful. And it came from Alex. We can do the same thing with Joe. We've got lots of highways for Joe um, that, you know, we wrote down that choosing an idea, writing quickly, paying attention to boring things. And now we can put this together for her. In her ultimate diagnosis was dysgraphia. We ruled out ADHD, but this is what it sounds like. For you, dysgraphia means your idea, your brain has a ton of awesome ideas, but it can be hard to choose just one and write it down. And she says, you know, I really do like the ideas part of writing. And her mother's jaw just dropped to the floor because she had never heard anything positive from this kid ever about writing. So I mentioned that sometimes we just might, we might not have a firm diagnosis, but we can you we can still use official words. Like this is called, you know, you're, you're working on organization. This is time management. This is motivation. This is what it's like to have really big feelings. This is called self-regulation. You're working on gear shifting. This is called difficulty with sensory processing. We're working with you on processing time. Or my favorite, for you, neurodiversity means your brain works best when your highways are in play and has more difficulty when you hit your construction zones. So this can be a really nice way to just say, you know, like we, sometimes there's not a name for it, but we know that, that neurodiversity is really important to our world. And for you, what this means is that your brain is built in a way that has certain highways and construction zones. So we have these two ways of explaining a diagnosis to kids. And it comes from the kids' words. And, um, and because it's the words that the kids use to describe their experience, it's automatically child-friendly language that makes sense to them and holds their attention. Um, this is another resource you can download from the handout section to explain um, with a lot of examples. Um, the next piece that I love to share with kids once we've really honed in on that diagnosis is that you are not alone. And so we're gonna use this to just really develop that ongoing positive narrative and welcome them into a community of amazing thinkers. Um, we have a spreadsheet of videos and visuals for explaining different diagnoses. This is the page for ADHD, but there is a page for autism, um, for dyslexia, for um, emotional difficulties, um, and it just in giftedness, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, and a lot of these videos are just really great for um, families to watch together, for kids to watch at a different time. 
Um, this one is just about neurodiversity in general, which is just a really, really beautiful um, sentiment. Uh, and of course, if you are not already familiar with the How to ADHD channel, it is amazing. And in this video, um, my 10 favorite things about ADHD, these are all on the spreadsheet. Um, she just goes through why it's awesome to be a different kind of brain, even though it can be hard sometimes. So she's not sugarcoating. It's hard, um, but we can't throw out the amazing pieces of being a unique brain. Uh, uh, and then another one that you'll find on that spreadsheet is called Welcome to the Autistic Community, which is just a really straightforward um, definitely like, um, explanation of what it means to be autistic and have that different kind of brain. And um, oh, bring it home is just because you get to bring these videos home, you get to bring your book home, and it's just a way to continue that conversation with uh, caregivers, which is the last piece. And arguably the most important piece, because no matter how amazing these conversations are with kids, understanding is a journey. It's not a single event. We want to give everyone the same language and encourage kids to build that self-advocacy because figuring out what ADHD means is not about right now. It's about evolving that definition throughout your life. Figuring out what dyslexia means for you at age eight, it's different than what it means for you at age 28. And so we want to really set families up for keeping this conversation going. So if you just download the brain map, this conversation, I have kids who come back to see me five years later and still have this, you know, hanging on their wall next to their bed. It's visual. It evolves over time. It's their words. It's very strength-based. Um, especially for older kids, having this little summary is really, really helpful. Um, and it's a great um, just handout for meetings um, when, especially for Zoom, if you want to just throw it up there to get kind of the main points across. If you work with kids with lower cognitive abilities, um, this is a worksheet that's on the handouts page um, that just can really appreciate kids and give them that language, even if they're um, not in a place yet where they can understand their um, kind of how their brain works. And then, of course, the brain building books are going to be super, super helpful tools for just walking you through this conversation. You can just follow page by page um, with the different prompts and you get to add to it over time so that you're documenting your journey with the child um, and they get to participate in writing. It's really fun to have them write in the book and then come back. Uh, you know, a year later and see how their spelling has improved and their handwriting has improved, um, you know, and just to like have these, these visuals as a way to really drive some things home. So I hope this presentation has been helpful for you. I hope there's some nuggets that you can take to really add to your practice. Um, there are a ton of free tools on brainbuildingbook.com. Please download, use them all. Um, and then if um, the brain building books can be helpful to your practice, there's a discount code right there, AET10, um, that you are, are welcome to use. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you have. And thank you for everything that you're doing to support kids and their amazing brains.